When World War I ended, the Entente powers had won. But what had they won? At the price of 20 million dead and $200 billion spent to kill them, more than $3.5 trillion today, the European continent had been made a wasteland. Its mighty and victorious empires were broke, dependent on international imports and American money. Except for America and Japan, the winners were just as exhausted as the losers. At least one of every hundred citizens of every participating nation in Europe had died. In some, a quarter of the population was dead or wounded, and 15 million who had survived the fighting were maimed for life. In the months after the armistice, the bill became clearer. The war had cost the British Empire the equivalent of close to $50 billion, $1920. The French Empire was out nearly $26 billion, and the Russian Empire almost $23 billion, Italy $12 billion. America had shelled out $32 billion despite having participated in the war for only one and a half of its more than four years. And that was just the money to rebuild what could be rebuilt of the devastated lives, lands, and goods would cost still more. And what was there to rebuild with? Not much. For more than four years, Europe had put all of its effort into fighting the war. Arms industries had grown, but domestic mining and manufacturing had slumped. Protective tariffs to rejuvenate them were out of the question, since they would have affected American goods the most. Without those, it was cheaper to buy American metals and fuels than to restart Europe's mines and oil rigs. America, a major global source of minerals before the war, was now overwhelming, producing four times as much petroleum and five times as much copper as the rest of the world put together, for example. Production was still surging and wouldn't peak until 1919 or 1920, while in Europe it was down the tubes with no prospect of coming back up. But even though importing materials was cheaper, it would still cost money, and the victorious European powers were already up to their crowns in $16 billion of debt. That would be slightly under a third of a trillion today, nearly half of which was owed to America. In previous conflicts, it had been the losing side that ended the war with such massive material and financial dependence, severe economic depression, and horrifying casualties. The victorious leaders of Europe thus had two problems, how to pay to import materials for reconstruction, and how to persuade their citizenry that what they had gotten was a victory. They settled on a tactic that would accomplish both goals, get them money and make their own situation look good, at least by comparison. The tactic was to squeeze Germany. Financially, Germany would be required to pay enormous reparations so the victors could buy the metals, minerals, and fuels to rebuild their economies and industries. Materially, Germany would be stripped of the mineral resources that had enabled it to challenge the dominance of the British and French empires. This, thought those empires' leaders, would prevent another war. As one analyst later remarked, any nation may start a war, but capacity to sustain it effectively under modern conditions is about commensurate with its industrial power based on minerals. The Treaty of Versailles, signed in June of 1919, laid out how the defeated side was to be deprived of that mineral-based industrial power and how the winners were to take it over. Germany's overseas colonies, already occupied by British and French troops, were divided between them. France was to get back Alsace and Lorraine, home to the iron and coal that had powered Germany's mighty steel industry. The French negotiators insisted that France must replace it as the continent's leading industrial power. To that end, they also required Germany to hand over all coal produced in the Saarland, which would be administered by the newly created League of Nations. In the East, two-thirds of Germany's resources of copper, lead, and zinc were spun off into the newly reconstituted Poland, 
A separate treaty broke up Austria and Hungary, no longer united in empire, and ceded their most resource-rich eastern territory to Romania and to the new states of Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. Another treaty reduced the Ottoman Empire to a small part of Turkey, awarding some pieces to Greece and Armenia, but reserving all land known to have oil for the British, French, and Italians. The defeated powers were also required to supply free coal to the winners in compensation for destruction of their own coal mines. As for the financial squeeze, Germany would have to pay reparations of 132 billion marks in gold, roughly $33 billion at the time and more than half a trillion today, which would amount to more than $9,500 per capita. That was 83% of Germany's GDP at the time. Smaller payments were assessed for Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Turkey as co-belligerents, though unlike Germany, they were not actually required to pay. But taking away Germany's mineral base also took away its ability to pay, in money or in kind. Its required coal deliveries to France and Belgium were below the specified levels from the start, in large part because so many of its coal mines were in territory now considered French, Belgian, or Polish. In late 1922, Germany missed a coal shipment entirely. French and Belgian troops promptly occupied the Ruhr, what was left of Germany's industrial heartland. That was the last straw. In protest, German coal miners and factory workers went on strike, and production dropped from merely low to almost nothing. Fuel, goods, and food had already been short, and the government had already been printing money to pump it into the economy. Now, with more paper money backed with fewer physical resources chasing fewer goods than ever before, inflation set in, and then it soared. In 1919, 48 marks could buy one U.S. dollar. By early 1922, it took 320 marks, and after the Franco-Belgian occupation, one dollar was worth a trillion marks. A loaf of bread cost 200 billion marks and required a wheelbarrow full of cash to buy. Economic activity crashed, and German psychologists began to notice a common ailment in which otherwise normal people compulsively added zeros to any number they saw. Amid economic desperation and resentment, violence surged. Finally, American banker and diplomat Charles Dawes brokered a deal that saw French and Belgian troops leave the Ruhr, set a payment schedule and fundraising plan for reparations, and provided a $200 million loan to Germany to curb inflation, resume reparations payments, and stimulate recovery. Dawes won the Nobel Peace Prize for averting what had looked very much like an impending restart of the war. While their troops occupied parts of Germany to extract reparations, the European victors were busy trying to get out of paying their own debts. Protesting that the war had really been a joint effort to prevent aggression and autocracy from taking over the world, Europe's governments argued that to require actual payment for the wartime loans would sully the sublime nobility of the enterprise and make it nothing more than a sordid business transaction. Of this claim, they found the Americans skeptical, perhaps because the mostly empires and monarchies making it had recently been seen extracting debt payments from bankrupt Asian and South American countries at gunpoint. And in any case, sublime nobility was of less interest than money to a government that had just lent 5% of its national GDP to its allies, on top of spending another 17% of GDP fighting their war, and another $3 billion just released in reconstruction loans. Eventually, 13 of the European nations gave reluctant agreement to a repayment plan that amounted to a de facto forgiveness of more than half the total. Only Finland would ever pay off even that much. Much of the debt payment took the form of buying commodities from America, especially metals, oils, and other minerals. These were now a glut on the market. 
During the war, American mines, refineries, and factories had ramped up production as much as they could, however they could, without much thought to the longer term. In the oil industry, an initial post-war market stability gave way to a huge price drop in 1922 as wartime exploration activities resulted in the discovery of the California oil fields. By the next year, the oversupply was so bad that oil company profits were down by half. Led by Texas, the governments of oil-producing states stepped in. When voluntarily agreed production cuts didn't work, they passed pro-rationing laws that limited each well to producing no more than a set percentage of its nominal capacity. That produced enough to meet demand while curbing the oilman's enthusiasm for more drilling. It was a model of forward thinking compared to what was going on in the American metals industry. When the war ended, metal production remained at wartime levels. Once a mine or smelter had geared up, cutting it back down took months at a minimum. And that was if there was incentive to cut, which there wasn't. With prices in a downward spiral, production cuts made collective sense, but no individual company wanted to be the first to lose market share. So, with the war over, government price support ended, and a massive oversupply depressing prices, American mines set about producing more. Production of copper, zinc, and other base metals stayed far too high. For a few years, voluntary trade associations like the Copper Export Association managed to stabilize prices by brokering giant exports of metal to Europe on credit and distributing the sales across its member companies according to an agreed-upon system. This worked from the end of the war until late 1923, when the combination of high inflation, economic and political uncertainty, and fluctuating exchange rates took away Europe's appetite for large commodity sales. With lots of metal but nowhere to sell it, the trade associations dissolved into every company for itself. As each tried to outproduce and undersell the rest, the metals industry entered a prolonged depression from which it would not emerge for another 15 years. Not helping was a sudden and almost global onset of amnesia. Having just fought a war in large part over access to mineral resources, and having won the war by depriving their enemies of the metal and fuel supplies that they produced or bought in abundance for themselves, the winning nations managed to forget that minerals meant victory. In 1921, U.S. government officials compiled the Harbord List, a catalog of some 28 minerals likely to run short if another big war got started. Similar lists were compiled again in 1922, 23, 27, 28, 32, and 36. Absolutely nothing was done about them. Not until 1939 did Congress pass the Strategic and Critical Materials Stockpiling Act and begin accumulating reserves of minerals, metals, and fuels in case of war. The British Empire did nothing either, confident and complacent in the resources of its vast global empire. France overtook Germany as Europe's leading steel producer thanks to its new ownership of Alsace and Lorraine, but instituted no stockpiling plans. Soviet Russia had forcibly reincorporated much of the metal-producing territory that had enjoyed a brief post-war independence, but was having trouble getting anything out of it. Having liquidated landowning farmers, professionals, engineers, officers, and anybody else who knew how to run an organization, Russian factories in the early 1920s had one-sixth of their wartime staff and a tiny fraction of their former output. Only with the onset of the series of five-year plans and the importation of several thousand German and American mining and metallurgical engineers plus Western machinery would Soviet production rise enough to even meet existing demand. Having and stockpiling excess was years in the future. Only two countries that participated in World War I really learned its lessons, Japan and Germany. 
Japan had watched for four years as Germany and allies fought to stalemate against an array of enemies with five times their population, eleven times their territory, and triple their economic output until America entered the war. Thanks to its pre-war metal stockpiles, its advanced chemicals and steel-making industries, and the ingenuity of its chemical and, and metallurgical engineers, resource-poor Germany had held its own for far longer than anyone had expected after the blockade deprived it of most of its foreign raw materials. In the early 1930s, as its aggressive expansion on the Asian mainland sowed the seeds of another war, Japan would copy Germany's preparations, buying up foreign mines, stockpiling metals, boosting mining and industrial sectors, and starting research programs to synthesize nitrates and fuels. Germany had learned that lesson, too, along with another one that it was a strategic blunder not to help provoke a world war, but to provoke a world war before it had stocked up enough raw materials to fight one. To fight another, and this time win, would need more preparation. It would need a beefed-up industry supported by regained or reconquered coal and metal mining land. And there were many Germans who had endured the war to get mineral resources and were now enduring the peace deprived of them, who thought that was exactly what they should do. Germany, they thought, should shake off its dependence on foreign imports, the humiliating reparations payments and peace terms, get back the resources that Britain and France had taken from it, and rejoin the ranks of the self-sufficient industrial nations. Less than 15 years after the end of World War I, they would elect as Chancellor a man who promised to do just that.